Hey everybody, thank you very much for tuning in. My name's Darren Campbell. I am a, if I can get focused on the right screen here, I'm a software architect here at Zebra Technologies. I also do a lot of engineering and developer relations. And uh, I'm going to be speaking about, uh, just to give an overview, it's more of a beginner session about the kind of considerations that you as an application developer need to make if you're going to work within a EMM or an MDM environment. So EMM, Enterprise Mobility Manager, MDM, Mobile Device Manager. Uh, in our industry, typically every device will be managed but in some form. Uh, remotely and so this is something which new developers or you know, developers who are new to the field find a little bit strange or you're, you're used to developing applications yourself managing configuring those applications yourself and there's a whole set of things to be aware of as a developer uh, targeting enterprise targeting zebra devices that uh, you need to know uh, and hopefully this presentation will give you some overview of the, the kind of things that you need to be aware of so uh, we're going to cover, first of all, an overview of what an EMM is. I know not everyone tuning in here will, under, will sort of be familiar with EMMs, but we're not going to dwell too much on that. So if you are familiar, then hopefully there'll be content uh, towards the back half of the slides for you. Uh, just go over what the options are. Uh, honestly, this is an area which is continually evolving, particularly uh, innovative or innovations from Google coming in over the past couple of years and changes in how devices are managed, devices are set up. So uh, we'll go over some of those, uh, but with a with some developer glasses on uh, rather than sort of looking at it from an admin perspective. We have other talks if you want to understand or other platforms if you want to understand uh, EMMs from a controller administration perspective. Uh, so yeah, and then in the, the back half of the presentation, I'll go over what those considerations are for yourselves, uh, some other aspects that we've got that we're bringing into the platform. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sharing, uh, sharing files from the EMM to your application or to any application. In fact, uh, bearing in mind the, the additional restrictions of scope storage manager. This is something that Zebra are working on. Um, well, maybe I'm building it up too much, but I'm trying to, to sort of end on a bang, so it were. So, um, well, maybe I've built it up too much now, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll cover that at the end of the day. Uh, but before we get to all of that, uh, what is an EMM? What EMMs are available out there uh, for administrator so this typically tends to be the IT administrator or the CTO or some other administration personnel responsible for uh, the deployment and management of devices would also choose or select a EMM so an enterprise mobility um, management tool uh, the, the terminology has changed actually over the years so if you hear MDM if you hear UEM or EMM those are all kind of interchangeable uh, they do mean slightly different things but I'm not going to go into the to the details here uh, but what an EMM does for an administrator is provide a, a single plane of glass as they say uh, a single view remotely into all of the Android devices or, or any devices in fact these could be IoT devices these could be iOS devices uh, but hey, they show a remote view of where all your devices are and the status of those devices. So you, uh, this is just a screenshot which I selected from Google Images after clicking on the appropriate uh, like license rules um, to, to show in this presentation. Uh, but this happens to be from one of our very close partners, Soti, as a really a really big player in the EMM industry. But other EMMs are available, and they'll all do pretty much the same thing, just with different capabilities. They provide you with this, this is like a view of devices. Um, you can see the battery level of those devices, the operating system they're running, the model. Uh, in fact, you can even see if I put on my, um, oh, I think, oh, I never remember how to do this. If I put on my pointer here uh, somewhere, there we go, it's that button there. If I put on my laser pointer, uh, this is just a screenshot I got from the from the internet. You can even see that they're covering the separate technologies in their manufacturing model. So obviously a very close partner of ours. I literally just noticed that. And uh, yeah, available memory. But this won't be the only information on these devices. Uh, you would be able to see their location uh, in many instances. And it's not just view, but it's manage and monitor. So you could find your devices probably uh, with, with many EMMs, like, as you can do with Google Find My Device, but obviously, you know, 
in industry. We you know, have a more controlled way of doing that without associating with Google accounts. Uh, you have the ability to, very importantly, provision and configure those devices. So to provision the applications that are downloaded to them, and then the uh, like configuring things like whether the user is able to uh, enable the camera on the device. That's a very popular one. Like you might want to disable camera on the device and you could do that through your EMM remotely. So the user is never able to turn their camera on. Um, so that's a, like a high level image of what an, an administrator will see from an EMM console. I just wanted to put this slide up. This is some of the terminology that you might see as you uh, start to understand and explore the the industry or you know, how your application is going to work within these various systems so like i said before emm mdm they are kind of interchangeable if you come across the term mam that's just talking about mobile application management so i, I said on the previous slide that emms you would manage a fleet of devices and you would provision applications to them well that is all part of mobile application management so a subset of, of emm um, management obviously it's not just a case of deploying applications uh, you would be configuring those applications and i'll get into that further on in the deck uh, as well as maybe some other aspects of those applications you might be uh, like the, the the big one that springs to mind is pre-granting runtime permissions for example uh, in enterprise you do not want to rely on the end user configuring your device and think about a company purchasing zebra devices like they might be purchasing literally thousands or even tens of thousands of devices they want to configure all of those the same way the the fewer number of touches that you can have someone do on a device like ideally you want that to be zero the quicker it's going to be to configure and, and set all those devices up so that's really the end goal of remote device management to, to configure everything without really touching it or, or going through any settings or you know tapping on the device uh what else have we got so uh, if you start to look at the documentation for uh, like enterprise devices, then you'll quickly come into all sorts of terminology like work profile, fully managed devices, dedicated devices. And then even confusingly, if you're going back in a couple of years and looking at old blog posts on some of these topics, then you'll notice that some of the terminology even changes from well, not from year to year, well, maybe some sometimes, but uh, you know, over the years, the terminology changed. So uh, we've had uh, like BYOD used to be a, a big acronym, bring your own device or B, BYOP, bring your own phone. That uh, workflow where a an employee would be expected or encouraged to bring their own device into work and that would be able to be loaded with applications uh, in a controlled manner from their employer, like things like maybe they have a separate expense app or they have a, a line of business app for their travel, for example. Uh, and these are applications that the enterprise wants to manage on the employee's phone you could do that by adding those into the work profile and that way you have like a, a separate area of your employees phones for work versus uh, their personal life uh, but most of zebra devices well all of zebra devices uh, fall under the corporate owned uh, persona corporate owned description uh, where i mean obviously I've got got a few. Let me just try and find a device which uh, works. On it. So yeah, this kind of device, which is not showing up on the with the virtual background here, uh, this is something which a organisation would buy. They would own. They would, in most instances, expect to fully manage. And so you end up with these other terminologies like dedicated devices. Um, doesn't really describe Zebra devices very well because. Uh, but it's a, you know, we've, it's a very, very flexible, very functional device, but it's dedicated in the, the fact that it's, it's not a phone. Um, it has barcode scanner. You're expected to have this device and do maybe a single task if it's dedicated to that task. Um, but obviously, you know, it could be a manager who has this for all sorts of different use cases. Um, but in terms of how Google categorized this hardware, we do tend to fall under the dedicated devices tab or chart however you're looking at these things um formerly this was called kosu um which stands for corporate owned single use um single use obviously i've just said we don't have a single use but it's just, just the name given to these things uh and yeah so we we are 
obviously working with our customers. Um, in fact, some of our customers are exploring the COPE scenario where they would deploy a corporate owned device, but they would enable some kind of personal ownership for their employees. But that, that's something that we're exploring, our customers are exploring. Most of the time, if you're thinking about Zebra, you're looking at EMMs, then you're really looking at the, the dedicated devices tab. Um, and I'll just go out into, into my Chrome instance at this point, because uh, like, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, there has been a lot of uh, innovation in, in EMMs over the past few years. So if you last looked at this five years ago, the landscape would definitely have changed. Uh, the, the entry point that I think you end up with, if you kind of Google for EMMs, you'll, you'll probably find yourself very quickly at Android Enterprise Recommended EMM um, solutions. And like, obviously there are, if you go to the Zebra portal, zebra.com, and then find ISVs and retailers. I can't remember exactly how you find that, but we have our own like way of, of recommending EMMs to, to our individual partners. But uh, yeah, let, let me just show you what, what Google have on their, um, see, see the TV guide of, of what we're looking at here. So you end up at uh, android.com enterprise solution finder and it's going to take you through a little bit of a wizard to try and understand how you're deploying your devices uh, and this is like i say aimed at an administrator but i'm just trying to give you like a flavor of what an administrator has gone through before in order for them to manage your your application so just, just bear with me i know this isn't kind of developer focus but uh, uh in this uh, what, what Google are going to walk you through is the first thing it's going to ask is what's your identity provider? And the kind of underlying reason they're asking this is because Google have multiple solutions for EMMs, uh, for, for, for EMM, sorry, Google have multiple EMM solutions, which they're going to try and recommend to you. Uh, and then that's not the only player in the market. There are other players, but if uh, this is designed for, for all comers, so uh, a lot of people will be using G Suite, for example, not a lot of Zebra customers, but a lot of people just in the world using G Suite, are uh, they using BYOD, uh, like my way of working with devices, personal phones. And so the first tick box is gonna be Google uh, identity, but there are lots of other um, identity providers. It might be Microsoft identity, it might be something else. Uh, but what we tend to find, if you just click through here, uh, we have, different capabilities that you can select. Like the more you select the the uh, the more flexible options than Google is going to recommend to you. And you get through to the to the end here, sort of number of employees in your enterprise. And the uh, the results screen here will come up with just be aware of this. There's like three results from Google uh, with different price points and they're going to say oh, we've got the fundamental endpoint management. We've got Android Enterprise Essentials, uh, Google Advanced Endpoint Management. All of these are doing very similar things. Um, I, I don't, I'm not gonna get into exactly how they're working under the hood. Obviously some of these will, will work slightly differently. Uh, and Google are gonna recommend an approach to you, um, but just bear in mind, this isn't going to be the, the be all and end all. Uh, most Zebra customers will end up and find themselves in this fourth column over here, the uh, Android Enterprise recommended EMM provider, uh, which is not provided by Google. So it's only in this fourth column over here. And uh, so they'll say next, so if I go over here, okay. So once I select it, you'll see that the next step is to browse the different providers. So these are the providers outside of Google that uh, you, you might want to consider. And the, the main selling point or oh, actually no, that's, that's not a fair way of saying it. so uh, different organizations will have different requirements for their devices um, for example many of our customers still run uh, if not running the official AOSP build on our devices they'll be running a, a feature called GMS restricted and if you're running GMS restricted then you need to be knowledgeable about which EMMs and there's only a couple maybe three or four actually that support GMS restricted which is this ability to disable all Google apps and services on the device um, but there's a couple of other filters here uh, you're probably going to want full device management if you're a, a, a Zebra customer 
dedicated device management as well. Maybe you wouldn't want work profile management. It's more like the BYOD scenario. Uh, but here, like we obviously SOTI's come up. That's what I had the screenshot of earlier on. Many of our big customers use uh, many, of, many of these others like Microsoft Intune, Mobile Eye. And I'm not here to recommend a specific EMM. That's the job of our marketing team or our sales engineers who can obviously work with you and understand what you're doing. Um, but yeah, just, just understand if you click on any of these and you get more information. But they're all doing a, a, a pretty similar thing in terms of functionality. And uh, let me just show you, I think I've got on a, on a subsequent slide here, if I advance maybe a couple. Um, so yeah, this was just showing um, like the, the options. That this, this slide was here in case I couldn't find it in the Chrome, uh, but the Chrome works, so hey, here we go. Uh, so th this is uh, this is deliberately a complicated slide, honestly, to to try and convey to whichever audience I'm showing this to uh, that how this is not necessarily a, a simple like one way to do it, and every application works in the same way. Um, I put this slide together a few years ago. Actually, I have updated it slightly for this presentation. But uh, what I'm trying to show here is uh, there are a couple of different APIs which Google expose, and this isn't entirely obvious if you look at the documentation, because this, this is like the old API that they had. It's called the, uh, the Google Play EMM API. And this actually required membership into a dedicated community, which is no longer open for new entrants. So all new EMM players are being pushed towards this right-hand side here, this Android management API. And uh, there's always going to be in any EMM deployment, an application that lives on your device, um, which is responsible for the control of the device. So it's, it's called the device owner. Uh, there's other, other um, names exist for it. The device policy manager is, is, uh, is one. That's what the API is actually called. Um, but yeah, the, the, the single app that lives on the device, which is the device owner, if you have in your work environment, um, if you're like my work uses Intune, for example, to manage our like personally enabled Pixel phones in, in this case, um, then uh, you, you download an app in order to start that workflow. And the app that you're downloading before you sign into everything is the, the device owner application. But um, all I'm trying to really show here is uh, there, there will be always a cloud component associated with your application, something to log into at the back end. That will typically be provided by the EMM, so TEM Watch, Mobile Lion. Um, but Google do have their own cloud components. This sort of forms part of the, the, those Google three pillars that they were offering. Um, the API is hidden to you as a developer. You don't need to know any of this. You will only be, uh, you won't even be communicating directly, but you, I'm just trying to give you an overview of what, what the overall architecture here is of how like an EMM fits together. And if you receive updates and we'll come to configuration shortly, but if you receive those configuration updates then that's gonna be through the underlying Android platform. So uh, just look at time here. So hopefully that's given you an idea of what EMMs are out there, what EMMs do, how EMMs work, very high level. Um, so let me just cover things that you need to be aware of as a developer when you're developing an application that's controlled by an EMM. The biggest one um, that always comes back is how are you going to configure your application? Um, like I said earlier, understand that a, an, a device which is under EMM control will typically be part of thousands of devices and you don't want the individual end user configuring your application. This is going to live in an environment where the administrator, that, that guy or gal sitting behind a pane of glass screen in an office, maybe like thousands of miles away in a different country, uh, will want to control that device and to sort of you know, control how it works and what applications are on it and how those applications function. Um, Look at what you are, if you have an existing app, look at what configurations you're exposing today um, and how you expose them. If you're exposing your config through a, a like a, a three dots in the top right hand corner, then you go down to settings. That's not going to work in a, any a, a deployed scenario. You really want to move and you know, most of our customers today will have like a config file, config.json, config.xml. 
on the device. And uh, we'll, we'll get into to some of the difficulties with that actually uh, shortly, but obviously with the move to scope storage, that becomes quite difficult. How do you then share that config file between your application and the, the EMM? And I'm doing a talk on scope storage a little bit later in one of the follow-up sessions, and we'll go into a lot more detail of that in, in follow-up session. But um, for now, I'm just trying to like to, to, to raise a uh, in, in your thoughts, like what are you configuring at the moment? Which of those configurations would be appropriate and applicable to configure remotely? Uh, what configuration might you want to be done differently if you're running under uh, an EMM? One of the, the popular ones which comes up in examples is color scheme. Hey, maybe you want uh, your application to be used by various, and I won't name any retailers, but obviously, retailers have their own brand uh it would be nice maybe if that retailer could brand your application so if it is customer facing at any point a customer in, in terms of that retails customers then it would look nice from from their point of view you know and then uh your, your application it fits in well with them it becomes more popular maybe you monetize that i, I don't know but you know changing the color scheme something that you might want to do remotely um, any features that your app might want to disable when running uh, under an EMM or when running in an enterprise scenario. Uh, you don't really want to have two different apps, one for consumer and one for enterprise. Wouldn't it be good if you could just disable those more advanced features or disable the features that you don't want that, you know, maybe 15, 16 year old uh, assistant working with the app, this part-time job, or I don't know, whatever. It's not, it's not on their personal device. Um, how you actually do those configurations has, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking about managed configurations now. Um, you might be familiar with managed configurations from uh, a few years back. They were called application restrictions. Uh, they have been around for a while, but they've not taken off as much as I would have expected uh, because a lot of people are clinging to those config files, the JSON files, the, the XML files, if, if you're old school, uh, the any files, if you're super old school. Uh, and you find um, like there's no need to change those. But with scope storage, there is very much a need to, to change how your application is configured. So manage config is an ability for your application to expose a configuration option. In fact, you can have many configuration options, but you do this by defining what your options are in an XML file, which is part of your application resources. Uh, the configuration, the configuration configurable item will have a type, a bool, string, integer, multiple choice for like a selection. And then uh, what ends up happening before I start going on to, to point three there is your application is deployed to a device. And then through those EMM APIs I spoke about earlier on, the the, the the XML that you included in your in your application is analyzed by Google, by Android. Uh, and those choices end up getting automatically displayed on the remote EMM console. So just by uh, by defining a type as a bool, for example, in your application's uh, XML, it will appear as a as a checkbox, I think it is, or yeah, it'll be a checkbox when it uh, on the administrator console. If you define a choice, then that will be a radio button. If you define a string, then it'll just be a, a text field into which the administrator can type. And you, as the app developer, have not had to do anything clever. Uh, you've had, just had to define the type of that configurable item. And then there will also be a, a name and a description that you define in your XML. And you can see from the from the example at the bottom there. And that name and description will help the, so everything's automated. So this creation of the remote pane of glass, which is configuring your application, uh, will be able to display that description alongside the checkbox so people actually know what they're checking. Um, just bear in mind that obviously, if you're doing this remotely with multiple devices, then you're going to be configuring many devices at the same time. There are ways to group devices together in the EMM, and each EMM will do that a bit differently. But um, yeah, just it's, it's very powerful um, if you if you use it. Uh, and then whenever you launch your application, so in on resume, there's an API. Just check the state of that uh, configurable item that you've set, and also listen for a broadcast intent. Uh, so there's two ways to do it. If you're currently running and somewhere thousands of miles away, the administrator changing your config changes your config, you'll, you'll be told that by the broadcast intent. And it's up to you as a developer to action that broadcast. If they change the color of your app, then you're going to want to 
uh, well, I mean, in that instance, you probably have to shut the application down before you can reapply. But there will be configurable items that you can change on the fly. Um, but also always check in on resume because you can't always listen for broadcast intent. So just look at the status of config. Has anything changed? Action as appropriate. Uh, I think I've got an example uh, in this slide, which um, again, I took this a little while ago. So things, the UI might have changed slightly since then, but the principles remain the same. Uh, this is actually using Google's uh, enterprise managed Oh, I can't remember the name of it. Enterprise Management Essentials, I think. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's running in Chrome on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, you see a remote view of my screen. And what this is going to do is to just show some of the capabilities of Chrome, for example, uh, with managed configuration. So I'm just showing this is how it works like out of the box. I can use Chrome to launch an incognito tab. I could launch Chrome and I could sign into Chrome on, on, on my browser, like we, we've all done it. Um, but in an enterprise, those are two things which you might want to configure. You might not want incognito tabs. You might want to force incognito tabs. Uh, here, I'm disabling incognito tabs. You might want to disable sign-in. You don't want your end users signing into your browser because don't forget that's Chrome. That's going to be using their personal Gmail account. Like, even if your users want to do that, you might not want to enable it because of GDPR. You just don't want to worry about the whole thing. But notice now I've changed those settings and I can no longer launch an incognito tab and I can no longer sign into Chrome. It's going to tell me it's disabled by my organization. Um, this, is, this is just because Chrome in its... Well, millions of lines of code probably uh, has uh, somewhere like well within the resources section uh, defined the configurations that it exposes. I mean that's only two. Chrome obviously supports many other uh, uh, many other settings, and they are available uh, if you well if you do, do the same as I did there and uh, and run through. Uh, with Android Enterprise Essentials, but there are other ways that you can view the, uh, the the managed configs as well, like with test DPC, and I think I've got a slide at the end of the deck talking about that. Um, so let me just go on briefly. Uh, this is a term which you'll come across if you are working with our devices and you'll start hearing about hey, the devices being configured. So we've got, we've been talking about management of applications, and now we're talking about management of devices, you'll come across the term OEM config. And OEM config, just I'll cover the basics here, just understand OEM config is a subset of managed configurations. So the technology which underlines managed config is the same technology that underlines OEM config. And uh, I think I've got a, a couple of slides here just to show the difference between OEM config, which is used to configure devices, and managed config, which is used to configure applications. So what, what I've described at the moment is you, as a developer, you create your application, your schema, which is your XML, you upload that to the Play Store, and then Google Play is responsible for doing all of the magic of communicating uh, with the EMM console and getting that displayed on that pane of glass at the back. And then if anything is changed, then the config of your application is sent via Google Play. I mean, don't, don't worry about this step because this just is which API is being used. At the back end, uh, and then at the on the end on the device, you get or you get told, "Hey, configure the app in a certain way." The way that OEM config works, um, I've tried to to, to use the sort of same uh, same um, layout here. Uh, this isn't my. You can probably tell by the uh, by the change in color scheme and everything. This isn't quite my slide, but just forgive me here. Um, so, oh, here rather than a developer, we're talking about the uh, the OEM. This is Zebra in this case defines a device schema. So it's not just a schema of the application. Here we're defining a schema of the overall device, uh, things that you can configure on our device, and then everything works the same. It gets uploaded to uh, the. Uh, Play Store, and then you'll get the on the EMM console, you'll have all these abilities to manage a device. This isn't something specific to Zebra. This could be any OEM doing this, but I know Zebra best, obviously. Uh, what you end up with is uh, rather than a configured application, I don't know why I'm pointing with my hand here, you end up with a configured device uh, at the back end. So Zebra's OEM config, uh, like I said, is available in the Play Store. It needs to be in the Play Store in order to have that workflow I showed on the previous slide. And uh, the aim is to expose the capabilities of what we previously had uh, was something we called MX, and we still have MX, uh, but MX is proprietary, uh, whereas OEM config allows us to 
configure devices in an industry standard way, but still allows us to 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 add our special source would be the the, the way <laughs> the way I've heard here the uh, the US guys describe it. But essentially, we're we're providing functionality that is unique to Zebra, but we're doing that in an industry standard way, and we're just allowing administrators to configure our device through this mechanism in the same way that uh, uh, in the same way that you as a developer would would manage your applications and the real reason why i'm even going into all of this is to to try and convey to this audience that uh, there are many 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 uh things that you can configure on any Android device, and particularly with Zebra devices. So there's not only the Zebra specific OEM config things that can be configured, but there's all sorts of other things, configurable items, which uh, Android expose exposes through a standard API, which you could, which might be disabled. Uh, and just be aware of these. And, and let me just give some examples. So uh, previously, um, I, I showed how Chrome sign-in was being disabled. Well, it is possible through a standard API to disable account sign-in regardless of the application that you're using. You can disable the camera, you can disable uh, GMS backup, disable location. If your application is written to depend on any of this functionality, then you, you need to, to be aware of this, Like because then what's going to go wrong in your application if the camera is disabled, but you were relying on the camera being there. Do you fail gracefully? I would hope for that kind of simple camera use case you do, uh, but there are other things which you might not be aware of. Um, you're not expected to read this image on the right hand side. I'm just kind of trying to convey here the sheer number of configurable items that there are. Um, there are another like just example that came to my mind or examples like users in an enterprise environment won't have access to the settings. So if you're going to start trying to, to show the settings panel in your application to enable Wi-Fi or to rely on the end user configuring Wi-Fi by going into the quick settings menu, you know, the, the, the swiping down twice and those tiles, I've probably changed its name by now, um, that might not be enabled in an enterprise device. So that user might not be enabled to do that. You might need to uh, well, at least not prompt the user to do that and expect the device to have already be configured with network. Um, I think on this next slide, I'm just showing like how Google Maps will work if the account sign-in has been disabled. So this is an example of like you know, how Google have, have, have worked with. Uh, I'll just, it seems to be killing my computer running that animation. So let's go to the next uh, to the next slide here. So finally, this this is what I was building up to at the at the beginning of the presentation, and uh, I know we're a little bit low on time, but just I want to cover the difference now between scope storage. Uh, before scope storage, EMMs would download applications, uh, sorry, files to a world writable and world readable, therefore, location. Uh, and the application, your application, would be expected to load in that config XML, config JSON, config INI, and uh, yeah, that would just work. Um, the problem with that was uh, it wasn't inherently secure. I mean, you had to do other things to, to kind of lock down the device and make it secure from that point of view. But with scope storage, uh, that's no longer possible. Like an EMM is not, I mean, even if the EMM was automatically exempted from scope storage, your application is not. So your application cannot read the world readable location into which the EMM has placed your config file. So how do you get the config file from the EMM to the application? And like I said, if you want to know more on scope storage, I'm talking about that later on in the, in, in the, the conference here. So please do come along to that presentation. But in short, the answer that we are enabling for our customers is to use an Android file provider. So as the application developer, you will consume your configuration file through uh, an Android file provider. Obviously, that's a standard API. Um, but the challenge then is how do you deliver the config file to the application through an Android file provider? Or how does the administrator do that? Um, and the way that we've enabled this is through a modification to our OEM config, which uh, you see everything coming together now, uh, OEM config. So there's a new or there's an existing feature called File Manager, which enables the administrator to control files on the devices. You know, it's fairly standard file management capabilities. But the, the new thing which it can do now is to communicate with Zebra's Secure Storage Manager. This is a new feature introduced in Android 11 
documentation coming shortly. If it's not there already, I won't go out and check now. Um, but this allows your application. So you're over here, you're the customer app in this case, and you're going to receive an explicit intent from the secure storage manager to tell you, hey, here is your file URI. And then you can read in that file URI using the standard you know, con file provider based on content provider uh, rules. So what you receive as an application is the file name, the URI that you need to read in, uh, and a couple of other attributes as well. Um, there is not yet a demo of this available, um, but we are working on that. That demo will be available in time, but I just want to go over how this is expected to work. So you as an app will receive an explicit intent with the uh, URI. Obviously, it's an explicit intent, so you could receive this in the background conceivably, uh, if that's how you've, you've chosen to do that. Um, and then you will, uh, the administrator will define they, so they, the administrator want to deploy a, the file to you. So what they need to do is to tell OEM config or, or stage now, which I haven't gone into, but you know, just, uh, that's, that's our offline tool for doing this kind of configuration. So they need to say, here is the file. It might be stored remotely. In fact, it probably will be in, in most cases, or it could be locally on the device from, a, from a, an actual world readable location. Um, you need to define the target application. So that's you as a developer. And the administrator will need to also define the target application signature. Uh, this is like essentially the public certificate of your signing key. So they will have this, well, depending on how they've chosen to deploy your app, they might not have this. Um, I would recommend looking at the link I've put in the slide here. Uh, I guess go over what a signature is, how you generate it, how an administrator comes to know this. Um, they will either be downloading it from the Play Store. It gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about uh, application bundles where Google are signing the application themselves. But regardless, get the signature. And then there's a couple of other uh, options as well, typically. I'll just show what that looks like in Stage Now, our offline tool, like I say. So we're defining, it looks like this is for the, the Data Wedge DB file as the target application. And then signature hasn't yet been populated, but this will be a DER file, I think, um, for stage now here. And then whether or not it persists across an enterprise reset, I didn't get into that, but uh, yeah, this is whether or not you want it to persist across a, a, essentially a, a clean wipe of the device. Uh, so yeah, that's how you share a file. And the final thing I wanted to cover here for this audience was how you go about testing your application in a in, in, in an environment where you would expect it to be deployed. So this isn't always easy. Like you as a developer probably don't have access to uh, to a, a, an instance of some of those big EMMs like SOTI, Airwatch, Mobileye. Um, you might want to go, not want to go through the, the effort of setting up some of the more basic Google uh, style EMMs, or maybe they don't have all of the functionality that your application will be subject to in, uh, in, in, in production. Uh, for those individuals, I would recommend using the test DPC. So DPC was the API, which I had that very small screenshot of earlier on that there's all sorts of functionality. And uh, what you can do, you can actually set up test DPC to be a, a pretend EMM on the device. So rather than have to rely on a server component, you can download test DPC from the Play Store, um, remove your, your, your Google account from the device after you've did, done that. And then you can set the device owner using, there's, there's more than one ways to do this, but you want to set the device up as a device owner for Zebra devices. So ADB shell, all of that, DPM set device owner. And then once you do that, you get access to all sorts of management capabilities. And this was the screenshot from the Play Store. But if you actually download it, it looks like they've updated the look and feel uh, since that those Play Store images. Um, but yeah, every, pretty much everything you can do through that DPC API, you can also do through uh, test DPC. And uh, rather than uh, rather than like dwell on this, let me just show uh, a video on this slide, because I think we're running a little bit short of time. But uh, yeah, this this is going to show and an application I have, um, it's it's showing it in the work profile, but just just ignore that. That's it's, imagine this is on the, a fully managed device here, um, and this application is going to access the location of of the the device. And you can there is a 
function in test DPC to pre-approve runtime permissions. So as a developer, you know, if you want to access location, you need to request the fine and the course permission or just the course, you know, it's complicated there. Um, but what you can do is pre-grant pre runtime permission. So here, that was showing it when it's not been pre-granted, but I can launch into test DPC. I can search for like permission. It's, it's easy. There's so many options. It's easier to search, um, go to manage application, go to the actual app, and then you can just click on access find location, allow access course location, allow. I get a notification as a user telling me that this has been like pre-granted by the end user. That wasn't my app that was showing that, but now notice that I can launch the app and immediately I'm told that location is enabled. Uh, when I recorded this, I had to cut it off at that point because I obviously don't want to show my real location on, on, on a video here, but just believe me that the location would, have, would appear one frame after, after the video cuts off here uh, and as part of the fused location provider. Uh, so with that, I, I always include resources. So I recommend if you if you want to understand EMMs more, go to Android Enterprise Recommended. Just Google Device Policy Manager if you want to understand more. Um, but yeah, if, if there's any questions, then uh, obviously if, if we don't get to your questions, uh, I know I've run a little bit long here, but we can uh, we can address these in the developer portal or there's a LinkedIn group, there's a Twitter. Uh, I'm active on all of these and we have a developer relations team who can address your questions. So with that, thank you very much for listening.